Well, good evening, everybody. Let's try that again. Well, good evening, everybody. There we go. Well, we're thrilled that you've come back to join us this evening. I know the weather is horrible. I appreciate those that have ventured out in it safely and have made it here by the grace of God. I know there are people watching online. I know there's some small groups that are meeting in homes right now and, and other people that are watching online as well. And I just want to welcome you to the Highland Seventh day Adventist Church and the A God Worth Knowing series uh, outreach that we're doing right now. Um, just a couple of housekeeping. Just a reminder is if you haven't registered, please register. Uh, and uh, you can do that out there. You can do it by scanning the QR code on the screen at this time. If you haven't checked in, make sure you check in because that's how you win the prizes and uh, how we're tracking that. Um, we have our restrooms, one on each side. We have snacks at the end. Uh, we also have child care that is available for those uh, that would like to have that. Um, also, just a reminder, and I will say this at the end as well, is that we have our obviously meeting tonight, and then tomorrow night, Tuesday night, will be another meeting, and then we're off Wednesday night, but then Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, Saturday evening, that's all the way through. So this is kind of the one, the, the, uh, the pause will be on, on um, Wednesday night, and so just want to encourage you guys to, to continue to come out and support um, in this great series that we know God is already moving on. Um, there has been questions about uh, the materials that D talks about. He says, you know, there's, there's the worksheets or, or um, recap sheets that he has, and those are available in the back on the table. If you want one that you did not have before, go ahead and talk to one of the pastors. Let us know. Email us at office at highlandadventist.org, and we can make sure if those that are watching online or even if you're here, you want those sent to you digitally uh, we will make that happen so that you can have those study guides as well available to you. So just want to encourage you to continue to study on your own um, if you are not able to get those, and they are on the back table when you leave. And if you want more, we have more available. So just contact us or talk to Pastor Steve or myself. Again, we're just thrilled that uh, Dean and his wonderful wife have been here, and I know I have been blessed tremendously, and I know I've heard from many of you that God is blessing and so um, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing our theme song, and then we'll have a special music, and then we will give the time over to Pastor D. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our great God, we just thank you that even though it's cold and rainy, it is warm in here. Lord, that you have been able to provide for us a place of refuge, that whether we're watching online, we're hearing this maybe later, or we're here live in person this evening, we pray for the Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts and our ears to hear the words that you have shared so long ago in these beautiful pages of Scripture. So, Lord, as Pastor D preaches, we just pray for that spirit to move on our hearts. Whether we are diehard, committed Adventists long, long, long time, or whether we're new, we're new babes in Christ, or maybe we're not even sure of this God, Wherever this message finds us, may you begin to soften what needs to be softened and open our minds to that concept of this God that you are. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I just invite you to come up and uh, sing our theme song, and then we'll have our special music. Please sing with us. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. Oh, I want to know.
Thank you for singing with us. Aren't you glad that we have a God that looks beyond our faults and finds our needs, amen? That's a God worth knowing. Shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that bought my liberty. Just why he ever loved me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me how marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul he looked on my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. He saw my need.
Again, that was a blessing. And uh, there's quite a few people here, even though the weather's inclement. God bless you. And uh, may he bless you a safe passage and dry passage home. Um, thank you for making your way out here. We'll do our best to feed you a solid meal and send you home uh, safely. So we covered in our previous meeting together, are we in this thing alone? We addressed the issue of, or the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how God has a pathway for success for us. Uh, he comes and pursues us and convicts us before we even know him. When we do believe in him, he, he actually speaks life and acceptance into us and tells us we are accepted in the beloved. And then after he makes us a child of God and declares us a child of God, he begins to teach us how to live like a child of God. And so we're going to pick up where we left off and jump into an important topic this evening of what it means to have a new covenant experience. What does the Bible say about being a new covenant Christian? And so I'm going to start with the word of prayer and we'll jump straight into our study. We're going to have a Bible study this evening. Do we allow for that here? Is that all right? Okay, good, because I was going to do it anyway, but I'm glad you're on board. Let's pray. God, thank you for these beautiful people. Uh, thank you for bringing them here safely. I pray that you give them that same gift going home. But I pray as we have this time in your presence that this place would be warm, welcoming, and filled with your spirit. And I pray that you would speak truth to us tonight and that it would be so undeniably clear and biblical uh, that we could see it no other way. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the New Covenant introduced. As we mentioned before, uh, you got pew Bibles there if you want. You can use your own Bible, you can use a phone Bible, or you can see the slides. Totally up to you. But we're going to Jeremiah chapter 31. Okay, the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. Some of my favorite verses are in here. We've quoted from this chapter more than once in our meetings already. Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31. Kind of an easy uh, memorization device there. 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make what type of a covenant with the house of Israel? A new covenant. Hey, which testament is this being spoken in? This is in the Old Testament. So the new covenant is being introduced in which testament? In the Old Testament, interestingly. And so it says, well, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So clearly something went wrong in a previous point in history is what's being alluded to here, right? So we're going to hit the pause button. We're going to go back to the context of this statement, and then we'll jump back into where we were. I uh, maybe kicked something or did something. Had a little bit of a blink there, but I think, I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So let's look at the Old Covenant defined. Okay, so it's introduced here, but clearly there's some context that we need to get to better understand the remaining verses in Jeremiah 31. So we're going to go look at Exodus chapter 19. It's the second book in the Bible. Uh, you have Genesis and then Exodus. Let's look at the Old Covenant defined. Exodus chapter 19 and beginning in verse 3. Okay, Exodus chapter 19 beginning in verse 3. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. So the nation of Israel has left Egypt at this stage. They're at the base of Mount Sinai, uh, where the Ten Commandments are about to be given and all that. Kind of that big, have you ever seen that movie, The Ten Commandments, with Charlton Heston and the big gnarly beard I wish I had? Um, yeah, so anyway, this is that context, that kind of time frame. And so Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel... You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you should be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel." So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. And then all the people answered together and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. That's Exodus 19. 
Fast forward to, verse, uh, to chapter 24. It gives the Ten Commandments in verse 20. Chapter 20, some additional uh, teachings and some instructions. Then he gets to chapter 24, and Moses gives all this information to the people, Exodus 24, verse 3, all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Second time we've heard that. Now verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Three times now, once in Exodus 19, twice in Exodus 24, all the Lord has said, we will do, we will do, we will do, and be obedient. Let me ask you a very simple question this evening for those who know, did they? No, right? I got a big shaking of the finger. No, that's absolutely right. No, they didn't, okay? So they did not. In fact, less than 40 days later, they are running laps around golden calf, right? A golden calf in pagan revelry. Clearly, they have not heard or understood. And this is one of the reasons why, if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, this is what Hollywood, Hollywood does, right? They put images in and you can't get them out. So you read Bible passages and you see Charlton Heston's face. You want to have that experience? Am I the only one that's had that experience? Okay. Yeah. And so he comes down from the mountain and when he sees this awful scene of this idolatry around this golden calf, he's holding something. What's he holding? He's holding the Ten Commandments. And what does he do with the Ten Commandments when he sees this craziness? He throws them down and breaks them. And it's not because Moses is a hothead and has a terrible temper. What he's doing is showing that they have actually broken covenant with God. This is on a slow death. I'm just going to do that. There we go. Uh, it's just like, shh, 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 save its life. So, yeah, so they had broken covenant with God. What Moses did physically is what they did literally. Does that make sense? They broke the law. They had broken the covenant, okay? And Deuteronomy 4 gives us some more insight into this. Deuteronomy 4, verses 11, 12, and 13, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, that's the fifth book of the, of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, this is Moses' kind of last words to the nation of Israel. He's recounting to them the law and the way that God has worked in their lives, the things that God is expecting of his people. And in this book, in fact, the word Deuteronomy basically means the second reading of the law. He's recounting all those principles, the history, and so forth. And so he's recounting to them in verse 11, you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, speaking of Mount Sinai, and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the words, but you saw no form. You only heard a voice. And part of the reason I think he says this is because had they seen his form, they certainly would have made an idol. They were that messed up at this stage and so prone to idolatry and appeasement-based religion. Wouldn't have been good. You only heard a voice. Verse 13. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. And what is that covenant according to Moses? the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So the Ten Commandments are the terms of that covenant, and that's why the article of furniture in the most holy place that has the law inside of it is called the Ark of the Covenant, okay? Because it has the Ten Commandments inside, which are the terms and the content of that covenant. So we're speaking about the law, right? The Ten Commandment law, uh, they're listed in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, and they highlight the principles of how God governs. Other-centered love directed towards God in the first four. Uh, you shall not have any other gods before me. You shouldn't make any graven images or idols. You shouldn't take the name of the Lord your God in vain to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. These are all connected to our relationship with God and a, a reciprocal relationship of other-centered love. Right? We're not going to share our love with somebody else. It will be distinctly and, and uh, exclusively shared with God. We're not going to have other idols we share our love with, right? Then it transitions to family. You shall honor your father and your mother. And then from there it transitions. So it goes from the vertical relationship of other-centered love, transitioning to a horizontal relationship of other-centered love. It starts with those closest to us, with family. And then it extends out from there. Uh, that you shall not kill, commit adultery, steal, 
bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's things or your neighbor's spouse, right? So it's this outworking of other-centered love. They are simple, reasonable principles, right, for ideal functioning of humanity, for our vertical relationships and our horizontal relationships, and it's all centered in other-centered love. These are just the ways in which heaven does life, and they're distilled into practical tools for humanity to walk in. Does that make sense? It's all God was looking for. In fact, many of these laws you'll see, even especially when it comes to the horizontal relationships, they're part of civil code, right? Because they're helpful for communal flourishing. So we go back now to Jeremiah chapter 31. We know what the terms of the covenant were, that Ten Commandment law. So let's go back to Jeremiah 31. We now know what went wrong, right? All the Lord said we will do, but they didn't, okay? Jeremiah 31, verse 31 again. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this, now verse 33, is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law where? In their minds. And what else will they do? He'll write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the principles of the new covenant involve the law being written on the heart and on the mind. And he will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, this whole thing is amazing. He's going to be our God. We're going to be his people. He's going to write his law in our hearts and our minds. And he's not going to remember our sins anymore. So the law here is no longer appearing to be outwardly imposed, but inwardly inscribed. But notice, it's still a part of the human experience, isn't it? In fact, I would venture to say it's even more a part of the human experience than it is in an Old Covenant context. Because in the Old Covenant, this is humanity trying to do for themselves, right, what only God can do for them. But when God gets involved in the New Covenant, he's writing it in their heart and in their mind. He's empowering them to do what he asks. The law is no longer this kind of external standard, we better get right or we're going to get in trouble, but we have to do it or we're going to get in trouble, right? This is their context. They came from Egypt 400 years in an appeasement-based religion. It's a vending machine religion. We have to cut ourselves through the virgin of the volcano. We have to do these deeds to get the gods to notice us and to respond. That's the mindset they had leaving Egypt because they were there for 400 years. So when they get to the base of Mount Sinai, God's trying to make a reasonable, biblical, righteousness by faith transaction with them, and they're incapable of even seeing it at this stage. And we're going to get into that and what happened. But that's where they are at this stage, okay? And so, but this is what God wanted to do for them to empower them to do it. it it's a more internal experience as opposed to an external standard. Does that make sense? It's what God wanted for them. So the law doesn't go away. The covenant doesn't end. What changes is the onus of who's making sure that the people keep it. Does that make sense? All the Lord has said, we will do, or God's saying, I will write it in your heart and in your mind. Does that make sense? God is now promising to empower them to keep it instead of them promising to keep it in their own strength. Also, it's really easy for us to assume that when we don't keep the law, we're cast off and can't be God's people anymore. You ever felt that way? But here's the thing. Part of the new covenant, the new covenant which was given to lawbreakers, is that they will be brought into God's favor through God's pursuit of them. This is what brings them into favor with God. Okay, they're already in his favor. They will be my people and I will be their God. Their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Almost sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Can God forgive me? Would God really do that? Well, those thoughts come from Revelation 12 tells us, the accuser of the brethren, who accuses us before God day and night. Right? That's what his job is. He stands before God and accuses us day and night, day and night. But my question is this. If God has no intention of remembering our sins, then why do we insist on reminding ourselves about our sins? Are you following with me? 
If God has no intention of remembering those sins that you confessed, why are we so desperate and tenacious in reminding ourselves and God of how awful we are and unworthy of forgiveness we are because I did that thing 15 years ago or 40 minutes ago? Did you repent? Yes. So why are we bringing this up again? If we confess our sins, he's actually faithful and just to cleanse us, to separate us from those sins, right? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does. And so if we keep beating ourselves up over things he's forgiven us for, we're not having a new covenant experience. And I don't say that to shame you. I'm telling you, you are entitled to a better experience than that. God has something better in mind for you. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6 gives us some more insight into what went wrong. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as Jesus is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. No longer is this a covenant that's based upon man's faulty promises to God. It's now based upon God's faithful promises to man and through the hands of a mediator. There's help. There's someone who's working on our behalf and mediating on our behalf. This is what God wanted for humanity all along. Okay, this is what he's trying to do for us. Verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Where I grew up, we had this statement or this saying, If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? If there was nothing wrong with that first covenant at Sinai, God would not have showed up later and said, I'm making a new covenant with the house of Israel. So clearly something was wrong. The promises were at fault. The author of Hebrews tells us in the previous verse. And then he goes on in verse 8 uh, to quote uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. He literally quotes that same passage we just read. And at the close of it, it says, uh, verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. And now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This old covenant mindset has been made obsolete through the ministry and mediation of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that tonight? So it's not the content of the covenant that's at fault. It was the self-confidence and self-righteousness of the people who made the agreement. All that the Lord has said we will do, they were trying to do for themselves what only God could do for them. Does that make sense? And in turn, they were, making a fault, they were engaging in a faulty covenant that was built upon faulty promises. Joshua chapter 24, we're going to pick up on this. Joshua saw this, and he saw this history of Israel making this repeated mistake. And so Joshua chapter 24, this is kind of his parting words to the nation of Israel. We can turn there if you like. I want to give a little bit of the previous context. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. This is like Joshua's version of Deuteronomy, okay? Recounting some things in the nation of Israel, giving some closing charges to them before he dies. And then he says, um, verse 14, we'll start a little bit earlier than the slides. Now, therefore, Joshua says, fear the Lord. So he's presented God's goodness before the nation, and he's making a transition now. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, okay? And in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You, you probably heard this verse before, maybe. Got little placards in your house, maybe that say something like this. Hobby Lobby, I'm sure, has all kinds of cute artwork with, behold, me and my house shall serve the Lord. And so uh, that's, that's verse uh, 15. Then we pick up on verse 16, and here's the response of the people. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell on the land, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And at first glance, you're like, you know what? I think they get it. And then listen to the response of Joshua, because it initially looks like the worst pastoral response in all of earth's history. Okay, they say, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua says, you can't serve the Lord. 
for he's a holy God, he's a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Can you imagine if, if, if the congregation here at Highland Church said, we will serve the Lord, and Pastor Benji said, you can't serve the Lord, and he's not going to forgive your sins. Doot, 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 doot. Yeah, Benji's boss, fire this guy, right? Like this is, this is unacceptable at first glance. Joshua sees the people still aren't getting it. They're mouthing the correct words, but they aren't understanding where the power source is, and they're still doomed for failure. So listen to what happens here. Um, he's putting his finger on the real issue at hand and what they still have not come to learn. Because even after the failed promise they made at Mount Sinai, and he precedes this firm appeal with the revelation of God's goodness, they still don't get it. I was reading a Bible commentary on this section not that long ago. This is what it says. The reaction of Joshua to Israel's pledge of commitment echoes Israel's similar pledge at Sinai many years earlier. They're speaking of Exodus 19 and 24. All the Lord has said, we will do. Even though the words were appropriate, the people needed to realize that it was not enough to make a brave declaration and pledge of allegiance. They also needed to recognize their inability of themselves to obey God and that they could not be forgiven while they were depending upon their own strength and righteousness. You understanding where he's actually coming from now? He's not a terrible pastor. Benji can stay, right? So uh, they needed to trust wholly in the merits of the promised Savior, represented by the sacrifice, who would forgive their sins and give them power to obey. Are you understanding? They still weren't getting it. And Joshua's worried for them. And so this is what God always wanted for humanity. This is a quote, one of my favorite quotes, actually. It says this, What is justification by faith or righteousness by faith? It's the work of God. The work of who? It's the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. And when men and women see their own nothingness, then they're prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When we recognize what we don't bring to the table and that we desperately need a Savior, now we're safe to be sealed with the Spirit of Jesus. You understanding? Okay. In Exodus 19 and 24, the Israelites clearly did not recognize their nothingness. And so in turn, they weren't in a place to receive the righteousness of Christ. Even Joshua 24, I would agree with. So now we get to Genesis 15, because the question then is going to show up of, well, why is it that God allowed them to make that covenant at Sinai? Who's kind of having that question run through their mind? If that wasn't the ideal scenario, why did God allow for it? Anybody else have that question? Certainly. Well, why? Why was that allowed for? And number two, did God set them up for success at Mount Sinai? Those are two questions I have when I read these, these accounts. So I'm going to geek out for just a little bit. I'm going to try to be as simple as I can, but I'm going to have to geek out just a tad bit. Um, I'll do my best to be a good boy. So in Genesis chapter 15, at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1, God shows up to Abraham and tells him, I'm your exceedingly great reward. Abraham then kind of shares his discouragement. You've promised me kids, I don't have kids. And then God says, let's go for a walk. And you can turn there if you like. I'll, I'll hit some highlights. If you want to know more about this, just go study Genesis chapter 15 and read the, the chain of events there. A lot of good stuff, um, but I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version. So then God takes him outside, says, look at the stars, Abraham. If you can number them, such will be your descendants. My promise to you has not changed. You are still going to have children. For those who don't know the backstory, Abraham is one of the kind of pioneers of the Israeli faith, right? He's, he, he's, he's the man that God made promises to, that a nation would be born through him. The Messiah will be born through his lineage. Jesus will be born through his lineage. He's an important figure in Scripture. And Abraham has promised kids, and his wife can't have kids for years, 25 years nearly, uh, until he eventually does have a son. It's a long wait. It's difficult. And in that waiting season, when God says, I'm your exceedingly great reward, that weight and the weight of that weight is, is, is weighing on him. I'm really sorry for that unnecessary repetition. It just, my brain got stuck. Um, but that weight was really ah, just weighing on him. I don't know how to say it. It's just, it is what it is. It's weighing on him. And so he tells this to God, and God says, my promise to you hasn't changed. Your descendants will be like these stars in the skies. And then God tells him to do something. 
he tells him to grab animals. And so he grabs these animals, and God tells him to cut the animals in half and to separate them. Sounds kind of weird to you, but in that culture, this is how they made a covenant with people. Okay, this is how they would make an agreement. They'd cut the animals in half, they'd separate them, and the two parties making the covenant would walk in the middle of the animals, basically saying this, so let what was done to these animals be done to either one of us if we don't keep our end of the covenant. That was Eastern covenantal language in that day. Sounds weird to you? Hey, no problem. But that's what it was for them. It wasn't weird then, okay? And we're speaking about their context, not ours. So God tells them to separate these animals, and then God makes a promise to Abraham, and he, uh, a deep sleep falls upon him uh, for Abraham. And then in verse 13, he tells Abram, "'Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs.'" And they're going to serve them, and they'll afflict them for 400 years. What does this sound like? Sounds like the Exodus, right? The nation of Israel spent 40 years in Egypt, or 400 years in Egypt, and then God would deliver them from there. This is well before this even happens, before Abraham has Isaac, who will then have Jacob, who has 12 sons, and Joseph being one of them, who will be in Egypt, which eventually leads all of his family to come to Egypt, and then they're there for 400 years. This is many years in advance, but God prophesies it will happen, okay? So the fact that God is, is speaking into the Exodus narrative is important because he's also speaking as something else, okay? So they're going to be in a land that's not theirs for 400 years, and the nation whom they serve, verse 14, I will judge. Afterward, they'll come out with great possessions, and as for you, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they'll return here. This is to the, 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 the wilderness area there. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The people who are living in the promised land have not gone beyond a point of being saved. And so God is mercifully not letting Abraham have all that land yet and build a family there yet in a fullest sense because there's still a chance that these people could see my goodness in your life and in others' lives, and they could change sides. So you can't, this isn't going to be yours yet. But after that timeline, then that will be the case. So it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, verse 17, a smoking oven and a burning torch passed between those pieces, between those halves of the animals. And on the same day, who made a covenant with Abraham? The Lord did. To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, and all these areas. So, uh, and then in Genesis 15, rewinding just a little bit, uh, it says in verse 6, And Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is an important statement. Abraham trusted the coming Messiah to be his source of righteousness. That's righteousness by faith. Abraham had that experience of trusting Jesus to be his righteousness. And in the same narrative where that's given, we're also told that an exodus is going to happen. Okay? And so when the nation of Israel, who is longing to be delivered, longing for God to deliver them as he promised Abraham, they should also be remembering how to be declared righteous and achieve righteousness by faith in the Messiah. Does that make sense? Those things are linked together for a reason. And Israel, once they get to Mount Sinai, totally don't get it. Instead of doing what Abraham would have done at Mount Sinai, they do something totally different. They say, all the Lord has said we will do, instead of, so let it be by your grace, for your glory, and in your strength. You understand the difference? This is where Israel got in trouble. But the last thing about Genesis 15 is, this torch that passes through these animals is God himself walking through the animals. And God is making a promise, so let what was done to these animals be done to me, Abraham, if I don't keep covenant with you. Here's the amazing thing. God is torn to keep covenant with Abraham. And that's what we talked about Saturday morning, if you remember. Jesus himself suffered, the Godhead endured this separation so that covenant could be kept with the seed of Abraham. Isn't this amazing? God is so faithful to his covenant and always has been. And so the real issue of the old and new covenants then, God set Israel up for success by linking how to find righteousness and that you will get out of Egypt. I promise you, I'll deliver you from Egypt. He put those two things together so they would remember. They didn't. And God has a choice to make here. Think about it this way. 
How many people in this room have kids? Okay, your parents. There's quite a few of you. So how many of you have given the most clear and thorough explanation of what needs to happen and what the consequences are if they don't do it, and you're trying to protect them from those consequences? How many people have gone through that exercise, right? If you're parenting or discipling and so forth, and then you find out that they're just not listening to you, and so you repeat it, and they still aren't getting it, and you repeat it, and they still aren't getting it, and eventually you have to let the consequences teach them because the teaching didn't teach them. How many people have been in that situation? You've had to watch the kids reap the consequences. This is exactly what happens at Mount Sinai. God has repeated examples of what keeping covenant is to look like, what righteousness by faith is to look like, and how to do it properly. The nation of Israel tried doing their own thing, and so God meets them where they are. He lets them make a covenant that he knows is doomed to fail, not because there's something wrong with him. It's the only thing that's going to get them to recognize their need of a savior. Does that make sense? He allows them to crash and burn so they'll recognize their need of a source of righteousness outside of themselves, and that's why Sinai was allowed to happen. Does that make sense? So the only covenant God ever wanted the nation of Israel to make was the same covenant that Abraham made, to trust the Lord as a source of righteousness. That's the original covenant, but it's not called the old covenant because for a covenant to be ratified, blood has to be shed. And Jesus' blood for this covenant he's making with Abraham won't be shed until many years later. But blood was shed at Sinai in between those two things. Does that make sense? So the Sinai covenant is called the old covenant, but it's actually not the first or the real covenant. It's only given that chronological term because blood was shed first. I know that sounds kind of nerdy. It, if you don't get it, you don't really have to. But if you're wondering why old and new, the new covenant is actually the original covenant and the only covenant man was supposed to enter into. That's the biblical for, form that God wanted Israel and all of humanity to enter into is a new covenant experience. But it's not actually new. It's the original. It's just called new because blood was shed before the one we call new was ratified. Does that make sense? Anyway, I've, I've geeked out long enough. So Jake, Joshua and Caleb understood this whole scenario of what was going on. They saw it, and they tried to set the, Israel up for Israel, uh, the nation of Israel for success. So listen to this. This is Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. The backstory is, after Sinai, God is leading them towards the promised land. He wants them to take it. And they send out 12 spies to go investigate the land to see if it actually is a good land, which is kind of an act of unbelief when you think about it. Because if God is calling you there, it's going to be good. Amen? But they send spies. And when the spies come back, Joshua and Caleb have a positive report. But the other 10 people are terrified. The people are tall. It's a, it is a land full of milk and honey, but they're huge people. We're going to be, you know, breakfast for these guys. We just don't stand a chance. And the report of these 10 so discourages the entire nation, they don't want to go. They refuse to go. And the nation is mourning now because of this turmoil. And in Numbers 13, Joshua and Caleb try to reason with them. Okay, this is number 13 of verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. The narrative even talks about how the people were tempted to stone Joshua and Caleb over giving good news, unfortunately. Then we get to chapter 14 of verse 6. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. And then what does he say? He says their protection has left them or departed from them. What does he mean by that? Exactly what God said in Genesis 15. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You can't go in there. You can't take over this land or attack these people. I'm protecting them because there still could be a chance that they would turn. They now have hardened themselves beyond a point of turning. And so J uh, Joshua says here, they've, their protection has left them. He knows Genesis 15. He's quoting that history. So don't fear them. 
All the congregation said to stone them with stones. And so the glory of the Lord appeared and shut this whole thing down. And unfortunately, the nation of Israel wanders for 40 years unnecessarily because they did not pay attention to all of Genesis 15. They only paid attention to get us out of trouble. They didn't pay attention to the most important part. Does that make sense? So for 40 years, they wander in the wilderness for not accepting the gospel of righteousness by faith. And then God has to bring a new generation in at the end. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36 and see what this new covenant experience is supposed to look like. Ezekiel chapter 36, and we'll begin in verse 22. God has raised up the nation of Israel to reach the world through their teachings and the example of God's goodness in their lives. There's supposed to be a light on a hill that everyone is drawn to. Their worship is reasonable, it's attractive, it's awesome. God blesses them, right? They don't have the sicknesses and diseases that other people have. They're prosperous. This is what God always wanted. But the nation of Israel continued to struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and get in their own way. And so in verse 22, God tells us the state of affairs at that stage. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I don't do this, what I'm about to do for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. Now imagine, you've hired a contractor to get the surrounding nations to fall in love with your brand and your business. And the result of your work is that everybody in town hates your guts and they hate what you represent. What would you do with that contractor? You would fire them. God has a problem here. The people he raised up to win people are pushing people away. They're actually blaspheming the name of God because of the examples of people who claim to know God. By the way, does that still happen today? Unfortunately, right? And it reminds me of Romans chapter 2 and verse 24 where Paul says the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Can you imagine getting a, law, a letter from the Apostle Paul, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you? I believe he's quoting Ezekiel 36 here for this issue. And this is one of the main reasons why young people and, and, and old people alike leave churches. People who claim to know God are not looking anything like God. And so they say, if God is like this, there is no God. It's the French Revolution relived. If God is like this, I'm out. Same situation. So what's God going to do about this? Verse 23, he says that all the nations shall know that I'm the Lord, says the Lord God. How? When I'm hallowed in you before their eyes. In short, when you look like Jesus. And you think, hey, that, that's a very ideal idea, uh, idealistic idea seemingly at first glance. But how are you going to pull that off? The next verses are beautiful gospel promises of how God is going to do this. The unbelieving world will know that God is Lord alone when his people look like Jesus. This is what they've been looking for all along, and this is what God has been wanting all along. The Israelites were selfish, narcissistic, judgmental, and nationalistic. They felt entitled to the favor of God because they were his chosen people. But what they didn't realize was this mentality and behavior kept others from knowing that they were God's chosen people too. They weren't better than everyone else. They were just the messengers to tell everybody else that they were also invited to the wedding feast. Are you understanding? This was God's call for Israel. This makes some people uncomfortable because I thought we're supposed to support Israel. Well, was God supporting what Israel was doing and making him look terrible? No, right? So the question is, what does God say about the circumstances? And we'll address that idea in a future meeting of what, what was God's intention for the nation of Israel. I think it's important to study that biblically and not just receive everything we've been told. We'll do that in a future meeting uh, called A God Who's Always on Time. We won't do that tonight. But it's important here. God's struggling with the nation of Israel and their influence, okay? They weren't better than everyone else. They were just the missionaries and contractors who would represent Christ to the world. That's it. God wanted to win everybody, not just Israel. And I hope you say a resounding amen to that. God does not only love Israel. God loves every human being on this planet, and he wants to win them. Israel's job was to win them. Israel refused to do that. They led people to hate God. So what does he do? Here's his promise. Here's what he's trying to do. 
The call for Israel was missional. So how's he going to make that happen? Verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and I'll bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart. Does it sound like the nation of Israel needed a heart change? Yeah, does God offer to provide a solution for that? Don't you love this? God is not shaming them for being where they ought not to be. He awares them to their condition, and then he offers them a solution in himself. This is how God deals with us, guys. When he speaks hard things to us, it's not to shame you or discourage you. It's to open your eyes to the fact that something's wrong. And once you can see that and humbly acknowledge, now we can have permission to come in and make those changes. Don't you love that? God wants to help you become who you need to be. And so I'll give you a new heart, he says, and I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. You got idols? You got things that you're running to to escape your pain and problems and so forth? He says, I can get rid of them. You're filthy? I'll wash you. You cold and indifferent to the things of God and the needs of the people around you? He says, I can give you a new heart. Then he continues in verse 27, and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. You notice what God's doing here? What, what's a repeated theme you see in these verses? I will. God here replaces the we wills of the people in Exodus 19 and 24 with 10 I will statements in Ezekiel 36. From between 22 and 32, there are 10 I will statements. So guys, the law was not the problem that needed to change. It's just a representation, an outworking of other-centered love. What's wrong with that? that those are the principles that drive heaven. God's not going to get rid of that. That's not his goal. His goal was to deal with us. We were the ones that caused the problem at Sinai. It was us. It was the human condition. Us making faulty promises to God instead of trusting Christ to be our source of righteousness. And so the new covenant experience is trusting Christ to not get rid of the law, but to write that law, to make that law a reality in my life so that I can live a life of other-centered, God-focused love. Does that make sense? That's what he's trying to do here. So we were the problem that needed to change. The law's relevance remains. Verse 28, Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Notice Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and Ezekiel 36, 22 to 32, have very similar promises in them, don't they? Kind of two explanations of, of, of the new covenant. And you'll be my people, and I will be your God. Verse 29, I'll deliver you from all your uncleannesses. I'll call for the grain and multiply it, and I'll bring no famine upon you. I want to bless you, he says. And I'll multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. God knew it wasn't a strong witness for them to suffer and not be provided for, but the reason why they weren't provided for is because they were pushing God out. They were trying to be God for themselves and be righteousness for themselves instead of trusting God to be their source of righteousness and provision. That's why they weren't a good witness. You know, sometimes we feel that we can't be God's people. And we kind of had this quandary that Paul has in Romans 7. He says, oh, I hate my own guts, right? Like the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do them. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You ever felt like that? Maybe that was your prayer last night before you went to bed, right? Why am I this way? Why do I not do the stuff I know I should do? I don't know how to get there, right? So sometimes we feel this way, that we don't do what we wish, and the things that we should do, we aren't doing, and it's a mess. But God assures us in this passage, and he tells us, I want to bless you. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I can transform you. I can change you. I can make you like Jesus. And he's making these promises, by the way, to a disobedient, ugly people. The very people he just made this promise to, he just charged them for causing the surrounding nations to want nothing to do with him, to blaspheme him. I don't know about you, but I take a lot of consolation in that. I don't know if you guys have seen this meme that says that when God had a call in your life, he took into account your stupidity. And then it says, like, most encouraging thing I've heard all year, right? Like, when God placed a call in our life, he knew what we are. 
He knew the dumb stuff that we do, the dumb stuff that we say, and he isn't limited by that. He can still bless you. He can still use you to be a blessing. We're going to close with this idea in just a moment. So in verse 31, then he says, you'll remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and abominations. The amazing, long-suffering grace of God will actually lead God's people to repentance. And Paul, again, in Romans 2, is quoting from here, I think, where he says, the goodness of God leads to, does anyone know what it says? Repentance. God being good to us in spite of our obstinance and slowness, that's what leads us to repentance. His long-suffering, his grace. God would do that for me, but I'm dirty. I have idols. I have a stony heart, and I don't obey. You know what the good news is? God's love for you is not based upon what you do. It's based upon who he is. Many of us are, are absolutely handcuffed and shackled by this performance-based view of God that is not in Scripture. God's love towards you is not based upon your performance. So it's not like, oh man, I gave a little extra to charity today. God's love for me just went up a tick. But then the next day, you know, I forgot to let that old lady cross in front of me. And I think God's love for me went down a tick. And I got to make up for that, right? I got to be twice as good, be more sweet to my kids. I got to give an even better Bible study or baptize three more people so I can get back to even par with God. We're living in this awful, destructive pattern of thinking that God's view or mood towards me is based upon my performance. And that just isn't biblical. That doesn't mean that God is okay with errant behavior or endorses it because God knows with that errant behavior will become painful consequences and no parent wants that for their kids. But his love for you is not based upon those things. Are you understanding? You can love someone and discipline them. Can you say amen to that, parents? You can love them and discipline them. But the difference is it's not based upon their performance. You love your kids because they're your kids. You don't love them because they did the right thing that day or not love them because they didn't, right? Like, that's not how this is supposed to work. So some here may be getting a bit antsy, though. So what do we do? Well, those I wills of God are actually dependent upon your I will. I will cease trying to appease God by my deeds. I will stop avoiding the conviction of his Holy Spirit. I will choose to believe the things about me that God believes. I will yield my will, my power of choice, and my desires to the one who's given all for me and desires my happiness. Those I wills of God are dependent upon your I will. Are you with me, guys? God is asking us to lay down our old covenant experience of I wills and to rest in his. And yielding our will and choosing to receive Christ's spirit of surrender is one of the hardest things you're going to do in human flesh. It's difficult. Our flesh longs to assert itself, but it will lead to our happiness and our victory, and it's worth it. We have to come to terms with the fact that we have nothing to offer God but ourselves. And one of the things I love most about Jesus is that our piety doesn't impress him and our dirt doesn't discourage him. His love for us is at its zenith no matter what we do, and our actions don't change that for the worse or for the better. I want to go back to this Bible commentary on Ezekiel 36, these verses we just read. It says, God will move his followers to obedience through the power of his spirit. This is a unique declaration about obedience as a result of God's working in humans through the Holy Spirit. Thus, obedience is not our achievement or performance, but a, a consequence of letting God work in us. I say this all the time. God is not impressed with your obedience. You know why? Because he's the one that did it. Oh, would you look at that? Like, no, he's the one that did it. He's not impressed by that, but he's blessed by it because that means you're allowing him to live in your heart and to transform you from the inside out. Does that make sense? And that thrills him, certainly. Thus, obedience is not our achievement or performance, but a consequence of letting God work in us. Alone, we're not able to follow him. Power to overcome evil and live in harmony with God's commandments comes from a source outside of us. And only the Spirit of God can transform hearts and enable people to observe His laws and instructions. And I love this closing line. 
What God requires, he also provides. Can you say amen to that tonight? That's what we talked about the other night as well. Paul alludes to this in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, save us, and it was weak through the flesh, because our flesh can't keep the law on its own, God did for us. How? He sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in flesh like ours. And on account of sin, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. He overcame sin in the flesh, and here's why in verse 4. So that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's what God wanted all along. Jesus lived the life that God requires of you, and Jesus is willing to live that life in and through you if you let the Spirit in. If you'll accept your nothingness and acknowledge your nothingness, that you don't have power to do what he asks, and you ask God to do for you what you can't do for yourself, guess what happens? Biblical obedience. God honoring biblical obedience. Going back to Ezekiel 36, verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I'll enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. Anyone ever feel like their life can be ruins? You ever feel like you've had some seasons in your life that looked like that? Listen to what he says. The ruins can be rebuilt. The desolate land should be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. The unfortunate truth is, when our lives become a desolation, people see that, don't they? Yeah. But he says, I can rebuild those ruins, and people who walk by will recognize something's different. He keeps going. So they'll say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Can you say amen to that? God can rebuild those ruins. And then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I love this. If your life is in ruins right now, he's literally telling you, you can ask me to do this for you. You can ask. He's inviting us tonight to ask him to do this for us. And I'll also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I'll increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like a flock at Jerusalem on its feast days. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. I believe part of that ruins that God is going to be working through in the last days here is raising up and reviving his churches helping his church to see the true message of righteousness by faith, that God is reasonable. He's not unreasonable. He's not asking a high standard with no path to success and get it right or else. I believe Adventism's best days are ahead of us, that God is pouring out his spirit and awakening us to our call and our purpose to show the world that God is not unreasonable. God is not asking things of humanity that they can't do and expecting them to do it themselves. God is inviting people to receive his power to live a transformed life. That's what God is doing. And I think that that revival is just ahead of us. Now, for some of us, this just sounds too good to be true. Could God really do something like that for me? Knowing how broken I am, how many times I've failed before, how many promises I made that I'm not keeping... Maybe we feel like there's dead and there's no hope for us to come to life. God actually anticipates this response. And he deals with it head on in the very next verses. And I want to teach you something about Bible study. If you were only reading as if this chapter means something and the next chapter is unrelated or disconnected, you're not reading the Bible as God intended. One of the best things you can do in studying Scripture is to actually get rid of the chapter markers. You can actually buy a, uh, what do they call it? It's called a reader's Bible. And they don't have chapter separations in them because that wasn't in the original Bible. That was added later. And it's a nice reference tool, but it's not inspired. And many times we will lose things in our reading of the Bible because we assume that this chapter ends and there's something totally different going on in the next chapter. And we lose stuff. And so the very next words that God says, I believe, are with the understanding that humanity would be prone to doubt the gorgeous promise he just made in Ezekiel 36. My life is ruins. My life is a mess. God couldn't rebuild this, couldn't rebuild that. I believe he he actually saw that coming. And look at the very next words that come out of the mouth of God. 
The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. This is Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Now to verse 2. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. How many medical professionals do we have in the room tonight? People who worked in the medical field. What happens when a bone goes dry? What hope of life does it have at that stage? None. What if a bone is very dry? The implication here is it is beyond hope. Yeah? So these bones are beyond hope. Then he caused me to pass by. There were very dry, verse 2, verse 3. And he said to me, and I love this, Son of man, can these bones live? Now God knows what he's about to do, but he's asking Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's smart. He says, "Uh, Lord, you know. So then in verse 4, he says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God of these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Surely you shall live. And I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and I'll cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and then you shall know that I'm the Lord. That's a direct quote from Ezekiel 36. There's linguistic connectors here between these two chapters. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and bones came together bone to bone. And indeed as I looked the sinews and flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over But there was no breath in them. And this is what false revival looks like. There's a whole lot of noise, but there's no power from heaven to change the life. Lots of noise, but no real power from heaven. Continues. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And some of us may feel like this guy's going way out of the left field. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something totally different. This isn't talking about people and whatever. Look at the very next verse. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent what? The whole house of Israel. And what are the people saying about themselves? Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Are people thinking that today? I'm not good enough, I can't get anything right, God won't accept me, my life is ruins. It's Ezekiel 36. I have a heart problem, I have a stony heart, I'm a mess. And God's promise here is, it doesn't matter your circumstances. If you will cry out to me and trust my word and receive my spirit, no matter how messy your life may be, you shall live. This is the promise of God in Scripture, no matter how hopeless your circumstances are. So prophesy to them in verse 12, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I'll place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. God absolutely can raise you from the dead. Your case is not hopeless. You haven't gone too far. The promise of God in the new covenant is, I want to forgive your sins. Your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Just bring it to me. You got baggage, you got brokenness, you got ruins, you have generational curses in your family tree. You have promise after promise after promise that you're not keeping, that you're making to me. It doesn't matter. Just come. Bring your dead, dry bones into my presence and watch me raise you from the dead. That's God's promise. Are you with me, guys? God's law or expectations are not something to be afraid of. Our unbelief is something to be afraid of. Because if you come to him with just even a mustard seed of faith, he can do incredible things in your life. God is in the business of raising people from the dead. We serve a God who's in the business of transforming people. The question is, will you come? Will you trust your case to him? 
And so, again, he gives this gorgeous offer in Ezekiel 36. I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. God is literally asking you to ask him for this. He wants you to ask. He wants you to swing for the fences. Doesn't matter how big those berries you think may be. If you come into his presence, John 6 promises us, he will not cast you out. Doesn't matter what you're dealing with, how deep an addiction you may be, how much of a mess you've made of your life, if you come into the presence of Jesus tonight, he's not going to send you away. He will raise you from the dead, and people around you will take notice. Only God could do a resurrection like that. People will know. He wants you to enter into a new covenant experience, and if you want that tonight, I want to enter a new covenant experience. I want God to write his law in my heart and in my mind and to do for me what I clearly see now I cannot do for myself. And I'm choosing to rest in the power of God to transform my life. And if that's you this evening, I just want to invite you to raise your hand to heaven. God, I testify tonight, I don't have what you need. I don't. But if you do, and you're pleading with me to come into your presence and ask for help, then I'll come. I'm broke. I've got nothing but me. And guess what? That's enough. All he's ever wanted was you. God's not wanting you to make yourself into something that you can't make on your own. He's not asking that. He's not unreasonable. He's asking you to come broken, feeble, defective, and ruins. Bring that to him, and he can make something beautiful and useful out of it. That's what he does. God in heaven, I just want to ask for your hand of blessing over my friends here tonight. You saw their hands. Lord, you see our hearts above all. And you've promised to remove those hearts of stone from our flesh and to give us hearts of flesh. You've also promised to send your spirit from heaven to empower us to live the life that you require, and specifically that law-abiding life in harmony with the Ten Commandments of Scripture. Lord, I pray that if this is new information for us tonight, that we would recognize that a new covenant Christian is not someone who no longer needs the law or is no longer under the tutelage of the law. Lord, anyone who follows you, you will write your law in their heart and in their mind, and we see that now. We accept that by faith, and though it seems like a big standard, if you're willing to set us up for success, we don't have to be afraid anymore. And so, God, I pray that you would give each person in this room, each person who hears the sound of my voice, I pray that you would give us that new covenant experience. You would write your law in our heart and in our mind, and that you would do in, through, and for us what we confess tonight we are wholly incapable of doing for ourselves. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive us of our unbelief or trying to do your work for us. And I pray that you would set us up for success going forward as we hear the voice of the true shepherd leading us into that message of righteousness by faith. And we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message tomorrow night is on the topic of bad religion. Did the Bible actually foretell when the Christian church would find itself in the unattractive state that it is today? The things you see in the church of of violence, of abuse, of misunderstanding, of, of just the church not living up to its full potential. Did God see this coming and does he have a plan? We're going to deal with that tomorrow night with the topic of bad religion at 7 o'clock, and hopefully the weather will be much more favorable than it was tonight. But God bless you for coming, and we hope you get home safely.